Welcome to a Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series has already proved to be a very interesting one entitled Preparation for the End Time. And this is number 11 in that series for June 16 of 2018. It's God's, the, the title of the lesson is God's Seal <coughs> or the Beast's Mark. So um, we're going to find this very interesting, I'm sure. Before we start, as usual, we're going to ask you to pray with us. Our kind and wonderful Father, it's a privilege to be here, to think about you, and to discuss your word. May we find this very interesting and provocative, and may those who are listening in find it useful as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, God's seal, or the beast's mark, that sounds like quite a comparison. This lesson will identify or talk about the key identifiers of two very important groups which will exist just at the very end of this Earth's history, and they're discussed in Revelation 13 and 14 and a little bit in a few other places, but primarily Revelation 13 and 14. They represent the two great sides in those chapters, the two great sides in the great controversy. So let's start with a verse 15, verse 2, just to get an introduction here. Then I saw what looked like a sea of glass mixed with fire. I also saw what those who had won the victory over the beast and its image and over and the one whose name is represented by a number. They were standing by the sea of glass holding harps that God had given them and singing the song of Moses and the Lamb. So it seems clear that one of these groups is going to have a glorious victory when this is all done. But the first question I want to ask you is, why is this called the song of Moses and the Lamb? I thought we left Moses way back in Genesis. They were delivered from Egypt and mm -hmm. these are delivered out of the world. Okay, so it's a very similar situation, is it? I should add before we go too much further that um, we have asked a number of our other members to join us from my regular Sabbath school class, and you'll hear them speak up from time to time. Welcome. Thank you. So, <clears throat> um, I have a question. Yeah. Did the uh, people, when they crossed the Red Sea, did they sing a song of Moses? That song is found in Genesis 15. Exodus. I'm sorry, Exodus 15. Exodus. Yeah, Exodus 15. It talks about it in Revelation 15, but the song is in Exodus 15. And Miriam led out in the sea. That's right. Yep. Moses and Miriam were celebrating the deliverance from Egypt. So what will the sealed, because we're talking about seals here, what will the seals be celebra celebrating? Yeah, this is not a surprise. Oh, no. oh. Victory of what? Through all the hardships of the earth and they'll be going to heaven. Yeah, these people will be now in heaven, won't they? Well, Seventh-day Adventists have long, been, long stated that our messages to the world in these end times are in the three angels' messages. How well are we doing at presenting these messages? I wonder you out there, how well are you doing at presenting these messages? Do we even clearly understand them? Do we understand how to explain them in a gracious and convincing way? The third angel's message is the most fearsome warning in the entire Bible. So we need to know how to present it in a very winning, winsome way. Well, in these last That's chapters... It usually isn't presented that which way. Which is not usually presented that way. Good point. Thank you. These last chapters of Revelation speak much about Babylon. So who, where, what is Babylon? I would like yes. to offer a view. Mm -hmm. I was one that had to be punched between the eyes before mm -hmm. I could understand. So sometimes when it's not done in a winning way, it is effective, but mm -hmm. maybe it um, Some people offends don't. people. Yeah. But other people like, please tell me in plain English straight what's going on. Mm -hmm. So, well, okay. Jesus appealed to you know the Pharisees and the Sadducees throughout his uh, uh, ministry, but at the end he came down and and offered rebukes. Okay. In Proverbs, there's a saying uh, that uh, if we uh, 
persist in rebellion, God will send a cruel messenger against us. Sort of the, oh. what you were implying. I have a cruel messenger. Yes. I, yeah. <laughs> well, what you know, rather than let you go, yes. do yeah. something to get you your yeah. attention. Right. Well, if you if you remember in the second angel's message found in Revelation 14, I believe it's verse 8, it first calls us to come out of Babylon. And then that message is greatly expanded in Revelation 18. So we need to know who, what, where is this Babylon? A clue, a very interesting clue is found in 1 Peter 5 verse 13. Now, what do we know about 1 Peter who wrote it? About when was it written? Peter wrote Peter it. Wrote. Or maybe. Peter the Apostle, Peter wrote it. Uh, can we guess about the time? Well, after Jesus left the world. Okay. So it would be after the death of Jesus and before Peter himself was, was yeah. crucified upside down. So probably toward the end of his life, that would be somewhere in the, in the 60s AD. And he may have been in Rome when he did it. Probably. So here we find at the end of his first letter, he says, Your sister church in Babylon, also chosen by God, sends you greetings and so does my son Mark. Your sister church in Babylon. Now, is that in Iraq? No. no. No, you don't code. think he was in Iraq. Babylon is a code word for Rome. How do you know that? Well, somebody figured it out. You told me. <laughs> <laughs> so it says here, as in the book of Revelation, this probably refers to Rome as the footnote in my Bible. Was it, did he have a wink in his eye when he wrote that Babylon Pro word? Probably. No, he probably wrote that because he was trying to protect the church in, ba in, in, in Babylon. Uh, in Rome, yeah, almost certainly. So remember those ancient people all the way back from the early days of Genesis where it talks about Babel, the original site of Babylon. It meant gate or gateway to the gods. That's what the word Babel, Bab is gate and El is, is a word for God. So gateway to the gods. So that's what they thought it meant. But later, uh, Babylon came, the word Babylon came to mean confusion. And that came out of the fact that people's languages were confused there. Um, remember what the, what the people who, the tower builders, what were they trying to do? They were, they were trying to defeat what God had said. Exactly. They were trying to find a way around God's word, weren't they? God's plans. Well, just let me read you a note from the SDA Bible Dictionary. Babel, or Hebrew Babel, according to Genesis eleven nineteen, 19, the name means confusion, based evidently on the fact that the Hebrew word Balal means to confuse, but it came back from the fact that their languages were confused. The Babylonians, however, explained the name of their city, which they called Babilu, to mean gate of the god, or Babiliani, gate of the gods. Um, so there's two different, quite different suggestions for what the word might mean. Question, what god did they think their city was a gate to, or what gods? Well, the, the primary they? god of Babylon was Marduk, but there were others. Um, Bel was one, and there were others. Mm -hmm. But the primary god was Marduk. Marduk. And they used but to have a cartoon about Marduk the dog. That was a dog. Yes. But Moses wrote in Hebrew, and he was yeah. the one that said it was Babel confusion. Mm -hmm. So now Satan kind of gets into the Babylonians and try to divert mm -hmm. this word of God that says it's confusion okay. to, okay, this is just something else. You yeah. know, it's the gate to the gods mm -hmm. or whatever. So in this lesson, we will try to focus on the implications of both the term Mark of the Beast and the Seal of God. So, what does a sign or mark imply? Position. Okay, it might be something about a position. Yeah, that's a, a label of some kind. I remember. A a, I remember the police. Ownership. The police would go and mark the tires as they went yeah. along to see how if they how long you've been there, <laughs> how long they've been there. So that's kind of kind of works that way too. Yeah. Well. Probably the closest thing to what the Bible is talking about would be a flag in our day. It's just a piece of cloth, right? That's colored and so forth, but it has a lot of meaning. It has a lot of really important meaning um, to, to some people. People are willing to die for, for that combination of colors that they, mm -hmm. they show allegiance to. Well, 
Um, but in Bible times, wasn't more like a sign of ownership? It could mean that. In, in many cases, it meant that, yes. Um, Respect. So let's, let's look back and see what the Bible tells us about marks or signs. Look at Genesis 17. God said to Abraham, You also must agree to keep the covenant with me, both you and your descendants and future generations. You and your descendants must all agree to circumcise every male among you. From now on, you must circumcise every baby boy when he's eight days old, including slaves born in your homes and slaves born from foreigners. This will show that there is a covenant between you and me. It's a sign. Everyone must be circumcised, and this will be a physical sign to show that my covenant with you is everlasting. And you could read on there. But that was one of the first mentions of covenant. And then we come to Exodus 31. The Lord commanded Moses to say to the people of Israel, Keep the Sabbath, my day of rest, because it is a sign between you and me for all time to come to show that I, the Lord, have made you my own people. So the Sabbath was also a sign. So, and Ezekiel chapter 20 talks about that as well. So in Old Testament times, there were two marks or seals which were signs of one's relationship with God. There was the Sabbath and there was male circumcision. When we come to the New Testament, we find that the sign of male circumcision was replaced by the ordinance of baptism. Both of these signs were intended to imply that a person's mind and heart were dedicated to the Lord. And there's lots of verses to support that. One sign was physical, one sign was invisible, mm -hmm. and one sign was an action. Mm -hmm. So what is going to be the final sign well, that's where we're getting to. Okay. You're getting a little ahead of us. Uh -oh. That's all right. While virtually all Christian churches have acknowledged the right, that the right of male circumcision is no longer a mark of true Christianity, because it was originally a mark of Judaism, both of these signs were intended to imply that a person's mind and heart were dedicated to the Lord, and that's clearly represented later in the, uh, in the New Testament. While virtually all Christian churches have acknowledged that the right of male circumcision is no longer a mark of true Christianity, like as it was a mark of true Judaism, there is considerable disagreement about the role of the Sabbath in our day, as well as the role of baptism. We know that many churches have different ways of doing baptism. Remember that Jesus himself said what? Unless you're born again of mm -hmm. the water and of spirit, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. John 3, very good. Jesus himself also said the Sabbath was made for humankind in one of the not more generic inclu inclusive modern versions. We know that the Sabbath was given as the original covenant or sign between God and his creatures because that sign goes back how far? Creation. creation. All the way to creation, yeah. So now we need to look at some passages in Revelation 13 and 14. Look at Revelation 13, 15 first. The second beast was allowed to breathe life into the image of the first beast so that the image could talk and put to death all those who would not worship it. The beast forced all the people, small and great, rich and poor, slave and free, to have a mark placed on their right hands or on their foreheads. No one could buy or sell without having this mark. That is, the beast's name or the number that stands for the name. So what are we seeing here? Here's a death decree. Okay? If you don't accept the mark, you will die, okay? Well, we turn over to God. That was, that was the beast side. And when did that occur, or when will it occur? Well, we're going to talk about that in a moment, but okay. it hasn't happened yet. Let me just say that much so far. We're going to talk about when it'll happen. It will. Okay. We go to the next chapter where God tells his side, and these are the verses in that chapter. A third angel followed the first two, saying in a loud voice, whoever worships the beast and its image same people he's talking about, and receives the mark on their forehead or on their hand, will themselves drink God's wine, the wine of his fury, which he has poured out full strength into the cup of his anger. All who do this will be tormented in fire and sulfur before the holy angels and the Lamb. The smoke of the fire that torments them goes up forever and ever. There is no relief day or night for those who worship the beast and its image for anyone who has the mark or its name. So which would you rather be? Would you rather receive the condemnation of the beast or would you rather see the condemnation, condemnation of God? Condemnation of the beast. Rather be with beast. Jesus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a pretty scary yeah. thing. We don't have to be afraid of those that can kill the body. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Well, this sounds like the mark of the beast is a pretty serious thing, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. There are some very strong statements made in the book of Revelation about those who receive the mark of the beast. On one side, we are told that unless one receives this mark, he will not be able to buy or sell, and he's, in fact, he will specifically be uh, targeted to be killed. On the other side, we see that God's wrath will be poured out on those who receive the mark of the beast, and finally, they will receive the plagues of God. So either way, I mean, if everybody received what it says there, the whole world would die, right? Yeah. Because all the people who are opposed all the people who are opposed to the beast would die, and then all the people who were in favor of the beast would die, if, if it would sound like. What's interesting today is economic sanctions is the method of punishment that countries use, and that's an economic sanction. Mm -hmm. Well, what we have noted repeatedly in these prophecies is that the prophecies of the book of Daniel are closely paralleled to several of the prophecies about the beasts pictured in Revelation. Daniel 7.25 tells us that the little horn power, it also talks about it in Daniel 8, will seek to change times and laws. That little horn power is very similar in characteristics, we don't have time to go through all those right now, but in characteristics to the sea beast in Revelation 13.1-10. So let's look at the sea beast. Revelation 13, I'm going to read it from verse 1. Then I saw a beast coming up out of the sea. It had ten horns and seven heads. On each of its horns there was a crown, and on each of its heads there was a name that was insulting to God. So is this a friendly, God-fearing beast, or it's an enemy to God? Enemy to God. Okay. The beast looked like a leopard with feet like a bear's feet and a mouth like a lion's mouth. The dragon gave the beast his own power, his throne, and his vast authority. And while we don't have time to talk about this right now, if you go back, you find out that all of these heads and horns and their types of beasts are all found there in Daniel 7. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have been fatally wounded, but the wound had healed. The whole earth was amazed and followed the beast. Everyone who worshipped the dragon, because he had given his authority to the beast, they worshipped the beast also, saying, Who is like the beast? Who can fight against it? Now we need to go back to Daniel, I'm sorry, Revelation um, 12, verse 1. So who is this dragon? Satan. The dragon is Satan himself. How do we know that? Because it says that in Revelation. Well, um, and the dragon was brought to the dormant. Mm -hmm. One, four, two, mm -hmm. the the if city. you come down to Revelation 12 and you come down to verse um, 12, and so be glad, you heavens and all you that live there, for how but how terrible for the earth and sea, for the devil will come down to you, and he is filled with, with, uh, with rage, because he knows he had only a little time left. So when the dragon realized he'd been thrown down to the earth, so who's been thrown down to the earth? It's the devil, who's also called the dragon, and it talks about him at and the beginning nine. of, uh, what? Verse 9, it says the yes. giant dragon also, it does. Down, and it says the old the, serpent. Yeah. The devil, Satan. Yeah, the ancient serpent, or the huge dragon was thrown out, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan. So it's cl he's clearly identified. You know, so, one of the things we have to be careful of is Satan is always using other means to represent himself. He used the serpent, he's using a beast. I mean, dragon. it's what you call in law, maybe like instituting a crime. I mean, you're not the one doing it, mm -hmm. but you cause someone else to do it. And yep. that's what Satan's doing that's just so horrible. Right. He does not want us to know what we're talking about right now, that he's behind all of this. And at the end, he's going to personate Christ, too, Yep. to try to deceive the whole world. So what law was it that the, the little horn power tried to change? That we're, so we're actually saying that he's, he's, he parallels uh, the, the dragon. What law is it that the, the little horn, the dragon, tried to change? God's law. Ten times and laws. Well, it, it looks like it has something to do with time, right? It's interesting to note when you read the Ten Commandments, Exodus 23 to 17, there's only one that has to do with time. Which one is that? The fourth commandment. Well, we call it fourth, and this is the fourth in the Bible. Sabbath. It's the Sabbath commandment. Mm -hmm. Has anyone tried to change the Sabbath commandment? Yes. Mm, they yes. made it the third commandment. <laughs> the answer, of course, is that's, yeah, that's why we have to be a little careful how we number them, because some people call it the third commandment. The answer, of course, is yes. The little horn power, the second phase, 
of the mighty Roman Empire. So what's the first, well, how was the first phase? The pagan Rome that crucified Christ. And it was it pictured in prophecy as that nondescript, that terrible, awful, nondescript beast with iron teeth and brass claws and all that stuff. Yeah, but the second phase of the Roman Empire, going right out of the, the head of, of, of this first beast, was called the Little Horn. Okay? And what do, we, what do we know about that? This Little Horn power has claimed the authority to change the day of worship from Sabbath or Saturday to Sunday, which would, which they would claim as the day of the Lord. Notice, uh, notice something interesting. And, and by the way, well, we'll look at that in a moment. Uh, notice something interesting in Revelation 12 through 14. Whereas Revelation 14:7 is the only passage that speaks about true worship, there are six others in those two chapters that warn against the false worship of the beast and his image, and they're Revelation 13:4, 8, 12, and 15, and 14:9 through 11. So now, um, where did this idea of a Lord's Day come from? Revelation 1. Okay. John, John says, says, I was in vision on the Lord's day. day. What day of the week, according to the Bible, is the Lord's Day? Sabbath. The Sabbath. Jesus okay. said, yeah, I am Lord of the Sabbath. Now, some people call Sunday the Sabbath. How did that get started? Because it's the res Resurrection Day. Okay, it's the Resurrection Day. Yeah, that's correct. You know who the first people were that called Sunday the Sabbath? The pilgrims. The pilgrims. The pilgrims mm -hmm. who came to this country and they started calling Sunday the Sabbath. That's historically the fact. Oh. Um, they didn't call Sunday the Sabbath back in... Uh, they in called it the Rome. Lord's Day. They didn't call it the Sabbath. Because all the way down through history, Sabbath has always been Saturday. And even in the Romance languages, in, in Spanish, what's, what's Sunday called? Sabado. Domingo. No, Domingo. Domingo. Sabado is Sabbath. Right. That's Saturday. Yeah. Saturday is Sabado. Sunday is Domingo, means the Lord's Day. In French, Dimanche. So why did the pilgrims? Well, they like to think that Sunday was their day of worship, so they decided to start calling it Sabbath. So when you sing that song, Don't Forget the Sabbath, it's really referring to Sunday. Well, I hope, I don't know who wrote the song, so I'm not I think Fanny J. Crosby, who kept oh. the Sunday. Yeah, I've, gone, I've gone to two different types of Sunday churches, and one of them was very strict about keeping the Sunday Sabbath. And the other church, we have two problems. They believe the Sabbath was dissolved. Mm -hmm. and that Jesus is our Sabbath and that there's no Sabbath. So it has been changed in multiple ways mm -hmm. in whatever way can get around what is the, the, the real commandment. Yeah. yeah. Well. And the Catholic Church was very really um, adamant that Sabbath was Sabbath and Sunday was Sunday at that time because that's part of what they used in order to kind of say, you know, the Jews were the one that killed God or Christ, and that's why we're going to change to Sunday. Yeah. Well, the Catholic, the Catholic Catechism says Sunday is the day that follows the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, they, may, they make well, no bones about it. They don't claim yeah. Sunday is the Sabbath. Correct. It's the Lord's Day, and that's the day they want to worship. And it's they Lord's say... Day. They Lord's Day and, and Day of the Lord, two different things, huh? Because yes. in Joel... Oh, no, it is times, two different things. Okay. Yeah, so we need to be careful about that. Well, the, these two chapters, Revelation 13 and 14, that we're focus on, ha, focusing on, have some very interesting things to say in that respect. Um, look at Revelation 13, verse 10. Whoever is meant to be captured will be uh, talking about, okay, are you going to be on God's side or are you going to be on the Satan side? Whoever is meant to be captured will surely be captured. Whoever is meant to be killed by the sword will surely be killed by the sword. <coughs> this calls for endurance and faith on the part of God's people. And then if we pop over to the next chapter, Revelation 14, verse 12. Um, let me just page down here really quick. Come on. We find something quite similar. This calls for endurance on the part of God's people, those who obey God's commandments and are faithful to Jesus. 
So for some reason, we need some endurance. What's, what's the point of endurance? How would well, you define endurance? Endurance, you know, I, um, I like to run marathons. Mm -hmm. And those are called endurance sports. That means you keep doing it for a long time. It's not something just you do it for a moment or two and then you, uh, not a sprint, no. Steadfast is another word. Keep going, yeah. A careful reading of Revelation 12 through 14 makes it very clear that at the end, the end of this earth's history, there will be only two groups of people on this earth. There will be those who worship the Creator and keep all of His commandments, including the Sabbath commandment, and there will be those who worship the dragon, the sea beast, and accept the false Sabbath. So let's investigate carefully what is implied when the Bible writers refer to a seal. And, and, oh and both the groups are going to be in trouble. Yes. One group will be in trouble with the world and at peace with the Lord. And the other group vice versa. Vice versa, <laughs> exactly. But everyone yeah. is going to be in trouble. Well, let's look a little bit on this seal business. Look at Ephesians 1, uh, 13 and 14. And you also became God's people when you heard the true message, the good news that brought you salvation. You believed in Christ and God put his stamp of ownership, that's the word for seal, on you by giving you the Holy Spirit he had promised. Mm. Okay? His stamp of ownership on you by giving you the Holy Spirit that he had promised. And look a couple chapters over in chapter 4, verse 30 of Ephesians. And do not make God's Holy Spirit sad, for the Spirit is God's mark of ownership on you, a guarantee that the day will come when God will set you free. So, in light of that, this seal refers, means what? Ownership. Yeah. It's God's mark of ownership on his true people, okay? Look at a couple of other passages, 2 Timothy 2.19. But the solid foundation that God has laid cannot be shaken, and, it, and on it are written these words, The Lord knows those who are his, and all who say that they belong to the Lord must turn away from wrongdoing. Mm -hmm. So, the Lord knows who are his. I think there's one beautiful one in uh, Ezekiel 20.20. 20. Oh, yes. Yeah, talks about the Sabbath, Sabbath as a sign. sign. Very good. Seal, right. So it is clear from these verses that the seal of God is a mark of ownership, signifying that we belong to our Creator. Furthermore, it is clear that those who receive the seal of the, on their foreheads will one day stand on the sea of glass and be recognized as God's faithful, redeemed people. Now, hopefully, we're all going to be there. Okay? There's another verse that says... Those are mine, and they hear my voice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm always unsure, God, how do I know your voice from all the voices in the world? I mean, mm -hmm. so that verse, it gives assurance, but yet it creates doubt because... Mm -hmm. How do you know? How do you know? And that is speaking of the people in the world. They will hear me, and they will come into the fold. And, uh, okay. Well, it can be a promise too. Yeah. Uh, that uh, that you will know his voice. Uh, there's a paragraph at the end of uh, well, it's 363, I think it is in Desire of Ages. It's the end of the chapter on come apart, mm -hmm. where she talks about this, uh, spending time away so that we. Uh, mm -hmm. Be still and know that I am God, that mm -hmm. sort of thing. So Remove that we, the clutter. Yeah, so that we can know his will. We need to understand and hear his voice and know his will. So I, I mixed up some of those phrases, but okay. I, don't, I don't have it in front of me to, to read it. Well, there's Revelation 7, verse 3 then. It says, the angel said, do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees. So this has to be before the final destruction of the earth until we mark the servants of our God with a seal on their foreheads. So it's a mark. Is that something that we'll be able to see? Oh, yeah, you've got one, you've got one, you've got one. Or what? I don't think Satan is that stupid to make okay. it, you know, I, right? I mean, it's going to be something, it's a conviction, right? Yeah. Okay, which is, is fine. A but my argument is this. We're told that a law is going to be passed and anyone who has this seal is to be marked for death, and people are going to be trying to kill us. So how are they going to know? Well, the Jews mm -hmm. during the Holocaust had the 
mark on them. Is that going to happen to us? Uh, They're going to look yeah. for us on Sabbath day. Well, <laughs> that means if we, if we hide out and have our Sabbath somewhere, we'll be fine. As so long as we leave our cell fruit. phones at home. <laughs> by their fruits, you will know them. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's important to notice that the seal of God in Revelation is placed only on the forehead. This implies that only those who are fully committed to and willing to give up their lives for the truths they believe will receive the seal. By contrast, the mark of the beast can be received either on the forehead or on the hand. What does that mean? Action. It can be also received in the hand, signifying those who just go along because it is more convenient to do that instead of bucking the tide. So now we've got some additional inspired comments about that. Carrie? Those who are uniting with the world are receiving the worldly mold and preparing for the mark of the beast. Those who are distrustful of self, who are humbling themselves before God and purifying their souls by obeying the truth, these are receiving the heavenly mold and preparing for the seal of God in their foreheads. Mm -hmm. When the decree goes forth, and the stamp is impressed, their character will remain pure and spotless for eternity. That's from Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, page <coughs> 261, paragraph 1. Okay. So now, in light of what we have just looked at, yes. So it's interesting that the last phrase there says, their character will remain pure and spotless. Not they will become pure and spotless, mm -hmm. but they will stay the way they are for eternity. And you have a verse for that. Where's the verse? Um, it's in Revelation, also, Revelation, also. Revelation 22, 22, verse 11. Let those who are like that remain that way, both on the good side and the bad side. Yeah. One time I was in uh, Loma Linda and people were turning in old books. And there was an old book about Holland during the Reformation. And the trauma that country went of fighting against the Catholics. And the Catholics would bury the people alive. And the Dutch women actually dressed up in their Sunday best to go and lay in the graves and be covered with dirt. And I always, then they, they ate all their tulip bulbs too. And I always wonder, would I be brave enough? Mm. But that has happened in the past. Would we be brave enough to lay down in the grave? And she was wearing, they were wearing their Sunday best because mm -hmm. they were going to meet their God. Mm -hmm. So this stuff has happened. Yeah. Or Sabbath and best, as the case may be. Yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> or Sabbath best. Yes. Translate. Or Sabbath best, yeah. but <laughs> I was shocked to read okay. it. Okay. So in light of what we've learned so far about this seal and the mark it's and its proper observance, what does it have to do with the Sabbath? Does the Sabbath fit in there somewhere? Sabbath is the seal of God. Okay. But the scribes and the Pharisees were keeping the Sabbath, so they were saint, saints sealed and delivered, ready for heaven? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Isaiah 58, 13, <laughs> and 14. Okay. If you call the Sabbath a delight, did the Pharisees really call Sabbath a delight? No. Mm. But also you're sealed with the Holy Spirit, and that will settle, into, settle you into the truth, meaning you know, you know that the Sabbath is just a uh, recognition that God is your creator. Right. And your Savior. So you have good. to be settled in order to just go along with that. Surely, here's a very good point, though. Well, we must also remember it was the Sabbath keeping, tight paying Adventists who nailed the Lord to the cross right. on that fateful yeah. Friday evening and hurried back home to clean up mm -hmm. to keep the Sabbath. Right. Going. But so. they had put so many, made so many laws. Yeah. that really mm -hmm. destroyed the, whatever the meaning was of this true Sabbath. Could we keep the Sabbath in the wrong way and for the wrong reasons? Yes, yes sir. Yes. Yes. If we had the wrong picture now, of God. Now, come on, that couldn't happen to us, could it? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, so how do we know how to keep it correctly? Well, we remember those verses about endurance. It, it may not be always easy to keep the Sabbath correctly. It might be we might be like Daniel, who's opening his window so he can pray toward Jerusalem, right? But Jesus was your example. Mm -hmm. And if you do what he did, mm -hmm. some Seventh-day Adventists will tell you that you are breaking the Sabbath. 
by okay. doing what we, he did. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Remember, so, uh, and let's be clear about something. For, for some of you out there, I might be worried about the mark of the beast. There's good evidence. We don't have time to go through all of it right now, but there's good evidence to suggest that the mark of the beast will not be placed on anybody's forehead or hand until just before Jesus comes. Now, we don't know how soon that's going to be, so I guess that would be part of the question. But we suggested way back at the beginning of our lesson that Exodus 20 suggests that the Sabbath is a seal of God. Uh, what is in the Sabbath that makes it a seal of God? Ownership. Ownership. It has his territory, his title, etc. right there in the Sabbath commandment. But we recognize that the Sabbath is a day in which God asks us to rest as he rests at, at the end of creation week. Um, those who correctly worship the Sabbath with all that that implies will receive the seal of God. So what does worshiping on the Sabbath imply to you out there, to us here? We're worshiping mm -hmm. a creator God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We recognize God as our creator. That although we, we, we recognize that those accounts are very brief in the early parts of Genesis there, that those signified actual events in relatively recent times. So what are we arguing against if we worship on the Sabbath? Evolution. 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 And number two, the Sabbath is supposed to be a special time of worship in which God himself agrees to draw near to us. It is a time of special communion with, between God and his people. That's what the Sabbath is supposed to be for. So if that's what the Sabbath, the Sabbath stands for, what does Sunday stand for? Man's own works. Nothing. Like offering. You have a like verse Cain that off, Cain, uh, Cain offering his own type of offering instead of okay what but God who says asked. that the sunday is like that mm. well people like to recognize sunday because jesus was resurrected mm -hmm. but he was resurrected mm -hmm. to work a regular work day and jesus said remember me by doing this which was the lord's supper mm -hmm. So Okay, well, let, let's think this through now. We have suggested that we have pretty good evidence for the fact that the Sabbath is God's seal. Mm -hmm. So we would expect that a counterfeit seal would be similar in some way or another, right? Yes. So observe how seven, a faithful Seventh-day Adventist keep the Sabbath. Right. Contrast that to the way many in the world keep Sunday. You, you attend a brief church service, maybe even on Saturday night, and then you go about your own favorite activities, watching the football game, barbecuing, etc., etc. Given what we know about Satan's kingdom, a day set up by him would suggest an attempt to save ourselves by our own works. Right? Do we have inspired descriptions of what it means to be sealed in our foreheads? Just as soon as the people of God are sealed in their foreheads, it is not any seal or mark that can be seen, but a settling into the truth, both intellectually and spiritually, mm -hmm. so they cannot be moved. Just as soon as God's people are sealed and prepared for the shaking, it will come. Indeed, it has begun already. The judgments of God are now upon the land to give us warning that we may know it is coming. Uh, Ellen G. White, Manuscript 173. The easiest place is actually to find it is in Volume 4 of the Bible Commentaries, yeah. page 1161. It's a number of places, but many of those are not easy to find. And Susan. The Sabbath will be the great test of loyalty, for it is the point of truth, especially controverted. When the final test shall be brought to bear upon men, then the line of distinction will be drawn between those who serve God and those who serve Him not. While the observance of this false Sabbath in compliance with the law of the state, contrary to the fourth commandment, will be an avowal of allegiance to a power that is in opposition to God. The keeping of the true Sabbath in observance to God's law is an evidence of loyalty to the Creator. While one class, by accepting the sign of submission to earthly powers, 
receive the mark of the beast, the other choosing the token of allegiance to divine authority, receive the seal of God. By Ms. Ellen G. White, The Great Controversy, page 605. Very good. So we Adventists have knowingly, or maybe many of us unknowingly, taking upon ourselves a tremendous challenge. What's the challenge? How do we present a very controversial truth, this business about the Sabbath versus Sunday, without being argumentative or irritating or overtly controversial? How do we do that? I tried on a lady's Facebook page, and I was writing and writing and writing. Then I posted, and then I went back and erased, because there's so much to say. It is so hard to explain. She's a lawyer, and I was getting technical, and um, I thought, I've got to think this through. Mm -hmm. What does it mean to be settled into the truth, as Dennis read for us, both intellectually and spiritually? What do you think that means? It's become a part of you. Yes. Yeah. In other words, it's mental and it's spiritual, right? Intellectually and spiritually. This is, this is a person who says, I believe this is what's right and I will do it no matter what. Mm -hmm. Okay. It, it becomes ingrained in us. I don't think about, well, I should not steal. It does not even... Yeah. Well, whether it's a ten million dollars somewhere mm. or it's a ten cents, it's not mm. mine. Yeah. So okay. we know the principle, or and that makes the difference. Also, you know this thing about that we sometimes are so concerned. How do I explain to this person this thing about the three angels' message or something? You know, just pray, and God's Holy Spirit is the one that has the ability to convert or convict that person. It's not ours, it's just to present it. Mm -hmm. And God's Holy Spirit is His problem. And to love them. Yeah. Because but if they don't know that you love them. Correct. If no, they're no, set, no. If That's the, by your fruits you have to show yeah. that it, you believe yeah. what you're talking about. Now, if people are satisfied where they're at or coping with where they're at and not searching, it's pretty tough to educate them on, on, on a grant different paradigm. It's just yes. human nature is if they're economically well off and their health is good and they're socially they're set up, why would they want to change? Mm -hmm. We can, th we can th and project it on what they should do, but if they're not interested, you can't but force that, it. God that, can't force it. God is not forcing anybody. Yeah. That's how come we're in, in fact, this big controversy now. That's the opposite. This law, God's law operates on freedom because God is love. All physical, all governments that we deal with operate in force, and they exercise it through force, fear, and deception. That's all governments operate that way. Otherwise, you know, it's just, it's just uh, oh, anyway, in, in tax write-offs. Well, it's, it's, <laughs> it's still part of, of uh, force. Yeah. Right. Okay. Well, I'm going to come back to the question I, er, I asked a little earlier. So. Do you think when we approach very near the end of time that any of us could say, well, there's one who has the seal, there's one who has the mark. There's one who has the seal, there's one who has the mark. No. Yes or no? No. No. Only God can. No, I don't we know might have an mind. idea. Mm. But I don't think we should even waste time in thinking about that. I'm sorry. I well, but I, I'm <laughs> telling you, someday yeah. some, someone's going to be pointing a gun at you and says, I think you oh, have the seal of God. Oh, that's very clear. Yeah, well, that's, <laughs> that's, very, <laughs> that's very clear. Why are they pointing the gun at you? Because they think you've got a seal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, because yeah. you're not going along with the program. Right. So yeah. you're saying that it's going to be a question of whether you cooperate with the government. Well, that would be the outward sign that they would see. Uh, spiritual things are spiritually discerned, so they're not going to see that we are sealed and that our character is, is based on our relationship with God. So they're going to post themselves outside the, the door of the Adventist church and get everybody that comes walking in? Maybe. The Adventist church will be illegal at that time because it's against the law to keep Sabbath. So we're not going to be there. Many people will be also, more you know, Satan has worked this way for so many years, infiltrating mm -hmm. the true uh, people so they can just kind of tell on who is really in. 
So who knows at the end if that's going to happen. If you have one of these cards, they know more about you than you know yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yes. If you have this phone, you cannot hide anywhere. They yeah. can mm -hmm. trace you. Okay. They know who you are. Let's not kid ourselves. That I, I thought there. There, we were all going to have a t-shirt on so sealed. We're going to have it only for you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll okay. give it back to you. <laughs> uh, so let me ask you a question, a very pertinent question even right now. If a Sunday keeping Christian could observe you right through the day as you keep the Sabbath, would, be, would he be attracted or repulsed? Well, a Sunday keeping Christian wants to go to his ball game and wants to do things, so I think they would be repulsed even if they were attracted. So they would be in a dilemma because it's hard to give up selfish ways. Well, now, uh, let me take it the next step. I'm not saying, would he like to do something else? I would like to say, okay, forgetting the ball game for right now, is he going to be attracted or repulsed by what you do? Jesus attracted people, even his enemies. Mm -hmm. They were shocked many times, even the Pharisees themselves. Okay, now Jesus, Jesus was attractive to a huge crowd of people, many of whom came for healing. Mm -hmm. Are we going to be able to attract people by healing? But we do know yeah. that Jesus attracted some of the Pharisees as well. And I think we will attract people. When I first came to Loma Linda yeah. in the 80s or 70s or so when my mom mm -hmm. was sick, I was very attracted uh -huh. to the people. But I was repulsed when I picked up a book about the USA in prophecy, and I thought, how dare they? Yeah. And, but mm -hmm. then I was attracted to the um, caring doctors, the way they looked, how they mm -hmm. acted. And so it was, it was a, a confusing type thing. Okay, now let me ask you the next question that's related. How has Sabbath keeping actually affected your life personally? Anybody want to comment? Not much so far. <laughs> okay, yeah. not hope, uh, hopefully not in a bad way at least. Huh? It, I was, it way, was a wonderful. huge, yeah. it was a huge adjustment, um, big adjustment, but since I teach, I don't work on Saturdays. But in my nephew, who comes over my house all the time, he has a bit of autism. He actually says, you know, God has this right. You rest on this day, and then you're better on Sunday. Mm -hmm. If you just wait till Sunday to rest, you start the week tired. So he has come <laughs> to he has come to believe that God had a better system, uh -huh. and so he loves Sabbath because it allows him to be quiet with no excuse. Okay. But the Sabbath uh, commandment says you work six days yeah. mm -hmm. and rest the seventh day. It's not you work five days and then have two days off. <laughs> yeah, so don't, you, don't, you have to work six don't days, tell, Don't tell her nephew that. <laughs> the, way, the way it has affected me is, uh, you know, I was kind of born into the Seventh-day Adventist church, and it was very legalistic. I'm from Panama, so it was extremely legalistic. So for years I lived that way until I came to Dr. Maxwell's class, and mm -hmm. then you start looking at that, another look at God. Mm -hmm. And it's not that you have to do it because that's what it says. And that's what they teach you in Latin America. Mm -hmm. And it's more like I do it because I want to do it, because I trust him, because I like him. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think it depends Only a little bit where you're living. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Where I live, uh, Saturday and Sundays, the carpet rolls up on both days. But if you went out on Sunday with a very noisy chainsaw and opened it up at about... 10.30 or something, you might run into some trouble. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's just quiet. Mm -hmm. I, I just want to change, share you know. my own experience, but Gordon, I wanted to make a comment on yours. Uh, only the ones who have a right for a Sabbath rest are the ones who have worked for six days. <laughs> <laughs> okay, very good. Yes, well, uh, but go ahead. No, go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead. You had but, but, uh, but I would like for you to say, okay. um, I went to Adventist school 16 years, and then I ended up in a Catholic school. And we had 30, um, I went to the medical school in the Philippines, and we had 30 Jewish guys from the East Coast mostly who were classmates. There was one man, his name was Steve Grossman. It could not be more 
Jewish then, yes, Steve yes, Grossman. Yes, yes, yes. He says, Charles, we have biochemistry exam on Monday. You, you a heathen, keeps the Sabbath holy, and you're well rested on Monday morning, and you're prepared for the test. And me, a Jew, who memorized the Pentateuch, and he goes and would do all kinds of crazy things over the weekend. You know, and he says, you are taking my Sabbath away. You're a heathen. <laughs> <laughs> You're a heathen. Sabbath is by then. You're oh. getting the rest. Uh. You know, Sabbath really, truly found its beauty mm -hmm. in me. When no one was looking down the nose, yeah. are you keeping the Sabbath holy or not? I'd see the sun going down in the Manila Bay and I says, thank you, Lord. Thank you for giving mm -hmm. me the Sabbath day. Mm -hmm. Sabbath was a delight. All Sabbath right. was a delight. It has to be that. Well, we, we're taping in the season of tax season. Mm -hmm. And I have a good friend who's an accountant. And a number of years ago, she, she grew up an Adventist and kind of mm, wow. went her own way for a while. Mm -hmm. and very much. Very much. <laughs> and decided that maybe she was coming to Bible study with us and decided that uh, she would try taking the Sabbath off during tax season and found that her business grew mm. leaps and bounds. She was more rested and to this day. Much more efficient, she said. Yeah, much more efficient. <laughs> it's true. When I was studying this lesson, I thought, hmm, the mark of the beast. I wonder what people say about the mark of the beast. Mm -hmm. So I looked it up on, you know, you go to the internet, the source of all knowledge, right? <laughs> <laughs> if you look on the internet, you look up Mark of the Beast, there are some of the craziest notions in there that you could possibly imagine. I mean, all kinds of things from great big signs to seals to uh, computer chips to you name it. And it's related somehow to 666. Now, we don't have time to discuss all the 666 stuff, but you think any of those marks could be the right one? I think the number six, if you look at numerology, number six is an evil number. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And six, six, six is like a trilogy of evil. It's the <laughs> ultimate evil. You yeah. don't need any, it doesn't need to be, or won't be any worse than that. That's, yeah. that's a cryptic mm -hmm. way of saying it, you know. And you got to remember when, if, if uh, the apostle, or apostle John wrote this, or uh, then, uh, and where was he writing it? He had to be somewhat cryptic. Yeah. But it also was very descriptive because six has been around as an yeah. evil number for yeah. multiple thousand years of years. So anyway, that's one way to look at it. Before we run out of time here, we're clearly told that there's going to be government laws passed against those who keep the Sabbath and have the seal of God, although it won't say it like that. Uh, Joanne, I think you had something to, to read us about that. Okay. As the Sabbath has become the special point of controversy throughout Christendom, and religious and secular authorities have combined to enforce the observance of Sunday, the persistent refusal of a small minority to yield to the popular demand will make them objects of universal execration. Execration. Okay. It will be urged that a few who stand in opposition to an institution of the church and a law of the state ought not to be tolerated that it is better for them to suffer than for whole nations to be thrown into confusion and lawlessness. The same argument many centuries ago was brought against Christ by the rulers of the people. Mm -hmm. It is expedient for us, said the Willie. The Wiley. A Wiley, uh, how do you say his name? Caiaphas. Caiaphas. That one man should die for the people and that the whole nation perish not, John 11:50. This argument will appear conclusive on the internet and a degree, decree will finally be issued against those who hallow the Sabbath of the Fourth Commandment, denouncing them as deserving of the severest punishment and giving the people liberty after a certain time to put them to death. Romanism in the old world and apostate Protestantism in the new will pursue a similar course to those who honor all the divine precepts. The people of God will then be plunged into the scenes of affliction and distress described by the prophet as the time of Jacob's trouble. Thus saith the Lord, we have heard a voice of trembling of fear, not of peace. All faces are turned into paleness, alas, for that day is great so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it, 
Jeremiah 35-7. E.J. White, The Great Controversy, page 615. And Gordon, I think you're through a general decree. Though a general decree has fixed the time when commandment keepers may be put to death, their enemies will in some cases anticipate the decree and before the time specified will endeavor to take their lives. But none can pass the mighty guardian stationed about every uh, faithful soul. Some, of the, uh, some are assailed in their flight from the cities and villages, but the swords raised against them break and fall powerless as a straw. Others are defended by angels in the form of men of war. Also great controversy, 631. Okay, so we don't have time to finish all the details in our handout, but we would encourage you to look at our website, theox.org, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G, to, to learn what the wrath of the Lamb is. Uh, that's a found in, that's dispelled out in some detail in Desire of Ages, page 825, if you want to look there. So are we reaching out with, to others with the urgency of the message that's implied by this idea? We're talking about life and death things here. What are we doing to convince our neighbors that this is a life and death matter? Can we, can we do that without appearing to be crazy? Well, we know that in ancient times there were seals made and in, in, in used in, in identifying something by putting a little mark and a lump of clay and that those lumps of clay, when the city would burn down, would become very hard. And those have proved to be very useful for archaeologists to identify the time and the place and who was involved in there when they find something like that. So what about us? Is God today placing his seal on people? Here is, do we could do that to some of you here today? Uh, would God is God doing that? Is that something that will really happen at the end of time as we try to stand up for Satan's for, for God's cause at the end? Our kind and loving Father, we thank you for this brief time we've had to discuss this very important subject. We ask that those who are listening in might have found some guidance that will help them and some passages to look at to guide them in their thinking on this subject. Thank you for our time together. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. amen.